Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Praminder Raina, the lead principal investigator of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And thank you for joining us today. Um, I would like to begin today's webinar by acknowledging that as a national study, the CLSA is located on lands that are home to many diverse Indigenous nations. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories and acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past as we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous peoples and communities in spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Uh, before we begin our uh, session today, I have a few housekeeping things to go through. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. Uh, closed captions are turned on. To change caption settings, select captions at the bottom of the Zoom window. If you have questions or comments, you can type them in the question and answer box at the bottom of the Zoom window. However, please note that questions submitted in advance uh, will be prioritized. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat box to inform our communication team. And finally, only the presenters audio and video will be enabled through the, throughout the webinar. Our agenda for today will include an update on the CLSA, followed by three presentations that highlight key CLSA findings and impacts of the study. As much as possible, our speakers have tried to incorporate the question you submitted into their presentations, but we had our work cut out for us. There were more than 500 questions submitted in advance, but our presenters, uh, first presenter will be Dr. Uh, Christina Wilson, is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, Occupational Health and Department of Medicine at McGill University, and a senior scientist at Research Institute of the McGill University Health Center. And Dr. Wolfson is also a principal investigator of the CLSA. She leads the Neurological Conditions Initiative and the Veterans Health Initiative. She is also the director of the CLSA Data Curation Center and a site principal investigator of the Montreal CLSA Data Collection Site. Our next speaker who will follow Dr. Wolfson is Dr. Vanessa Taller. She is a professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Ottawa and a scientist at Breuer Research Institute, where she serves as a site principal investigator for the CLSA. Her current research focuses on the impact of bilingualism on language and cognitive processing, development of neuropsychological testing material for detection of dementia, and changes in brain activity in cognitive impairment and dementia. Next speaker will be Dr. Verena Menek, is a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences in the Max Reddy College of Medicine at the University of Manitoba. She is the inaugural site principal investigator of the Winnipeg, Winnipeg uh, data collection site for the CLSA. Her main research interests lie in the area of areas of healthy aging, determinants of healthy aging, social isolation and loneliness, and age-friendly communities. Our final speaker will be Dr. Brent Richards is a professor, William Dawson scholar, and FRSQ clinician scientist. FRSQ is a uh, Quebec uh, health funding agency at McGill University and a senior lecturer at King's College, London, England. Trained in genetics, clinical med medicine, endocrinology, epidemiology, and biostatistics. Dr. Richard focuses on understanding the genetic determinants of common age aging-related endocrine diseases such as osteoporosis and diabetes. He is the co-lead of the CLSA Biomarker Working Group. And uh, some, of the, this, the, some of the faces you see on the screen are our uh, lead team that is uh, spread across the country. And what I'm going to do is to take a few minutes to introduce you to some of our other uh, investigators who are not part of the Manitoba, Ontario, and, and the Quebec. That's what we are targeting today. And, uh, and these are the people from our other sites, and we will be introducing them in uh, future webinars. And we also have some slides here that introduce many of our uh, coordinators across the country who you probably see all the time whenever you go and visit our sites. 
And these are the people who actually make this make study happen. Um, what I'm going to do is to go to the next slide and uh, talk about a little bit of the history of the CLSA. Um, in 2001, this was a long journey before we even started to engage uh, any one of you. 2001, there was a meeting that was held in Ottawa to think about designing a study of this nature. That was in, and we put in a grant application. We were fortunate to receive the funding. And then we had our first investment in from the federal government to launch this study in 2009. So you can see here for eight, almost eight, nine years, we were just developing this study to make sure that, that we will have a robust study as we uh, get ready to implement. 2010, uh, recruitment began. The baseline data collection began in 2011. Uh, CHR renewed our funding in 2015. So, and then we reached our recruitment goal uh, of the initial cohort in 2015 of 50,000 participants. Next slide, please. So you can see here 10 years of data collection uh, are happening in 2021. We are a couple of years uh, late uh, acknowledging that because of the pandemic. And our first data set for researchers to use was released in 2015. So our 10 years since the first data release uh, it would be in 2025. So as a part of your engagement in the CLSA over the, uh, for the past 10 years, we really want to thank you for participating in this study. And without your participation, your commitment, your dedication, we wouldn't have the data that we have collected to date and we intend to collect for another 10 years. I'm gonna pass on to Dr. Uh, Christina Wilson for uh, giving you an update about the CLSA. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for Parminder, Parminder for that uh, intro. I'm always a little bit shocked when I see that we started working together in 2001. And uh, here we are in, in 2023 uh, with the success of the study, largely due to our magnificent uh, participants. And I'm so glad that, that people are having the opportunity to be part of this webinar. So I wanna just take a minute. I'm been tasked with talking a little bit about the nuts and bolts. Uh, of the study, and I hope I can explain a few things if you're if these are things that aren't clear. So we we describe the the study, and not you must be familiar with us calling it the CLSA, as both a research study and a platform. And some people say, well, what's the difference? Well, I think the difference is that in a research study, there's a very clear plan with specific questions that are targeted, and then what we collect should relate to these specific questions. So we did that. We did that over those nine years when we were doing the planning. But what's a platform? Well, if you think about a diving platform, so you've probably all watched the Olympic games and you've seen people on the platform diving. Well, the CLSA is a platform in that sense. It's been built and then people can go up there and dive off using the data uh, that's collected in the CLSA to answer many, many different questions. So it's both a study and a platform. And when we talk about the platform, we're talking about allowing researchers, according to our very formal process of review, to use these data both in Canada and around the world to answer research questions. So I wanted to just sort of uh, clarify the difference between a study and a platform. And we're both in the CLSA. Next slide. So there are a lot of institutions and you've been introduced to a few people on this call. This is really a national uh, collaboration. The institutions are very supportive uh, of the CLSA. Uh, so just, these are just the logos of the different institutions, both universities and research institutes that are involved. Next slide, please. So it's national in scope and I, I'm always quite intrigued when I see a map of Canada and I see that the cities are all squashed down towards uh, the border, but the cities that you see there are where we have the data collection sites across the country. The little blue dots uh, that you see are really uh, meant to refer to the telephone interviews. So we're able to do telephone interviews anywhere in the country, obviously, but we can only do the in-person assessments uh, from individuals who are living close to our data collection sites. But it's definitely a, a national study. Next slide, please. So 
I wish I, I don't really have a pointer, I don't think, at this uh, at this stage. So that's a little bit uh, of a challenge. But anyway, I'll just talk a little bit more about the platform. Things that you surely know from having read our uh, participant newsletters. We started out with over 50,000 participants at, at our at recruitment, and the individuals were aged between 45 and 85 at recruitment. Uh, there are a few questions that, and I went through all 500, uh, and one of the things I want to just tell people is that there are no, at this point, there are no new participants being recruited. Our recruitment ended in 2015, as, as Parminder mentioned, and so now this group of individuals are aging. Um, you are aging. I am aging as well as a researcher. And I just did a little uh, a little note on my piece of paper here. And I think our participants are now ranging in age from mid 50s to mid 90s, uh, which is really exciting for us that we're able to follow you over this extended period of time. And we're looking forward to another 10 years. So I have a big COVID uh, virus sitting in the middle. We all know that COVID happened and we all know that it did affect the way we were able to collect data in the CLSA. We pivoted very quickly to telephone interviews so that we could not only, of course, keep you as participants engaged in the study, but I think we're very proud to say that we were able to keep our staff engaged uh, by having them become uh, telephone interviewers, even though they, some of them weren't that uh, before. So I think this is uh, a testament to how we were able to pivot. And I do want to say, because I want to uh, also address uh, several comments, several questions that came in, we are contacting participants. We are continuing to do in-home assessments, but contacting some of you may be a little bit delayed uh, because of the pandemic, but we are looking forward to uh, welcome you all to the data collection site if you're participating in the comprehensive cohort or as part of the telephone interview if you're in the tracking cohort. So next slide, Laura. Okay, so there have been some enhancements uh, to this platform. Remember my diving platform analogy. And what we've been able to do is we've been able to, during the, the pandemic, we were able to add a questionnaire study and we were, had an amazing response from you with 28,000 uh, participants agreeing to participate in that. We were also able to launch a COVID antibody study during that time. Again, taking advantage, not only of you, of course, but also uh, of this platform to be able to get some real time information about a global uh, pandemic. In very recent years, we've added some other enhancements. We're doing a memory study. We also have a healthy brains and healthy aging initiative study. And we have seriously implemented our proxy questionnaire for those participants who can no longer participate on their own, uh, but need someone to help them. And there's a, we also are, had launched in 2021 a COVID brain health study. And I'm sorry, I don't have time to discuss uh, the details of each one of these right now, but just to say that we're building upon this platform as we move forward in time. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about uh, data collection. We have data collection on all of our participants through questionnaires where individuals, all of you are being asked to answer a large number of questions. And I have a little bit of a personal story uh, to tell you here. Hopefully it won't take too much time. In 2013, I got a telephone call from my mom and she said to me, I had a call from someone in Halifax and they said they wanted me to be part of a study. And I'm not gonna mimic my mother's Yorkshire accent, accent, but she did say to me, is this your study, love? So my mother, who's pictured here with my dad, was a participant in the tracking cohort. So I've seen both sides of the study. Um, she passed away last year, uh, but I also wanna say that I was her proxy, so um, would have been able to complete proxy interviews for her. So the tracking cohort is a very important uh, part uh, of the CLSA. What has been added new in this new follow-up, we've added some additional questions and we were able to release the tracking data a little bit earlier than the data from the comprehensive participants. And there's been a large number of publications and I know that our subsequent speakers are gonna talk about that uh, shortly. Next slide, please, Laura. So for the physical assessments, for those of you who come into our data collection sites and uh, battle uh, parking and uh, travel time, 
There are, we, you all know that there are a lot of physical assessments that we're asking you to do. And we've added in this wave of data collection wearables. And there are a few subsequent slides about that. So that's what's been uh, added new. And of course we have cognitive assessments as well as the bio specimen collection, blood and urine. And this year we've added for a part, uh, for a part of the group uh, stool samples as well. So next slide. So just a minute to talk about the mobility trackers. I'm really impressed when I go into our data collection site and I see all these being set up and plugged in, uh, ready to hand off to the participants. So we've included a tick watch, a thigh actograph, uh, and this is being asked of all comprehensive participants. And I really appreciate those of you who've agreed to do this and have agreed to do this data collection uh, at home. Um, in between your in-home visit and your data collection site visit. So next slide. So we have the sleep trackers. I haven't tried this one out myself, but I know that the staff, the Montreal data collection site have. So this is a headband, uh, the Muse, and there's also a wrist actograph. And what we're doing here is tracking sleep quality and sleep patterns. And there'll be a, a subgroup of our comprehensive participants who are being asked to participate in this. So 2,360 out of the total number. Next slide. So just briefly speaking about one of the things on the previous slides that the Weston Healthy Brains and Healthy Aging Initiative, we were able to obtain funding from the Weston Family Foundation to add uh, MRIs, uh, magnetic resonance imaging studies and stool samples for this subgroup of comprehensive participants and then the stool samples only for 6,000 comprehensive participants. And again, I want to thank those of you who have agreed or have been asked and who have agreed to participate in this. For, for, and for some of the sites, I know you have to go somewhere else beyond the data collection site. So it's much appreciated that you're giving this extra time to the CLSA. So next slide. This, this is a response to a number of your questions, and I think this is a really excellent question to ask. So what's happened to the 51,338 of you uh, that agreed to participate? Well, by the end of our second follow-up, uh, just seven, a little over 7% of you had withdrawn from active data collection, although the vast majority consented to continue through data linkage. So this is really quite a small number for such a large study, given what we're, we're asking you to do. Just a little under 7% of participants have died since their baseline assessment. And um, this is one of the things that happened to me. I completed the decedent interview on, for my mother and I, I, I felt that she really would have wanted me to complete her data collection for the CLSA. She was very proud of being a participant. And when I cleaned out her house, I had to remove the, the magnet from her fridge that she got from the CLSA. So we have, we have to think about ways to try and prevent losses. Um, and there were quite a few questions from people uh, about not being uh, contacted and I hope, hopefully you will be contacted soon. We've added some questionnaires that can be done online for those of you who move outside of the area, if that's needed. And again, um, introducing the proxy questionnaire for a proxy who can actually answer the questions for a participant who for whatever reason uh, decides that they're not able to answer questions themselves. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of publications, scientific publications and reports that have come out um, of the CLSA using data researchers who are using these data. And this is just a slide to show you a few of those. There has been uh, publications on depression during uh, the pandemic about informal caregivers. We've had quite a few publications on vaccine willingness just overall, not just COVID of course, but also influenza. And we've, uh, there are researchers who've always also looked uh, at the relationship between mild COVID and mobility problems. So you can see even just with these few examples, the scope of the data allows researchers to come in uh, to use the data in their own area of expertise and answer research questions that are of interest to them. And we do have a dashboard on the CLSA website that is interactive that you can go and take a look at that provides some of the COVID study results. Next slide, please. 
So these are the anti some antibody study findings. This has been another question that people ask. More than 18,000 people provided blood samples even during the pandemic. So we were very grateful to that. And we know that that was a hardship uh, for, for many of you. Uh, most of them were able to be tested and for the presence of antibodies that indicated infection. Many of the samples were collected before vaccines were available. So this was one of the main things that we looked at. And clearly the rates of positive uh, findings related to SARS-CoV-2 increased over time in all the provinces. Okay, so and younger participants were most likely to test positive, likely due to the fact that the, the older participants and people in Canada were probably staying away um, and isolating themselves a little bit more. And there are also results, additional results you can find on our website. Next slide, please, Laura. So how are these data being used? Next slide, please. So as I alluded before to researchers who are using these data, there are more than 500 research teams that have been approved to use the data since 2014. What's interesting, and I think this speaks well for the future of research and aging in Canada, more than a third are led by trainees. And I think um, that's really important. This is a way that trainees under the supervision of senior researchers can access these data and perhaps even make studies using the CLSA data part of their career uh, when they go into, uh, into their full jobs. Most of the projects are based in Canada, but we now have uh, research teams from the US, the UK, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Australia who have learned about the CLSA, appreciate its value, and who, have, who are now using and publishing uh, about uh, results related to aging. And there have been over 320 publications. And I should say that the CLSA does review each publication before it's submitted to a journal to ensure that the data have been used for the project that was approved, and also that the description of the study is accurate. Next slide, please. So these are just a few examples um, of the publications. So again, you'll see the variety publications on nutrition or and the development of high nutrition risk, publications on uh, age-friendly components of municipalities, successful aging and social participation, geno genomic studies, genetic studies, season and daylight savings time on sleep symptoms. So it's just a vast, a uh, number of areas. And then uh, another paper that was recently published, these are all 2023 publications looking at persistent COVID symptoms uh, in community living older adults in, in the CLSA. And all of these publications are listed on our website and you should be able to access them uh, if you wish. Next slide, please. So we've got a lot of media coverage, which is very exciting. We don't do this to get into the media, but we really want our results to be uh, relayed in, in lay terms to the public. And we've had publications, here's Parminder uh, on, in the New York Times, and also we've had publications in the Globe and Mail. So we've had publications both in the English press and in the French press. So that's very exciting because I think the uptake from these kinds, this kind of coverage is, is often larger, of course, than scientific publications. So next slide, please. So there have been some uh, impacts on uh, policy. We are connected with the World Health Organization and the CLSA data have been used in a baseline report on the decade of healthy aging. So that was a very exciting initiative that we were contacted uh, knowing the importance of this study and of your contribution that the World Health Organization was interested in this. And we, we participated with the community COVID-19 uh, immunity task force that was set up during the pandemic in order to do our COVID studies, at least one of our COVID studies. And we work very closely with the Public Health Agency of Canada, providing them with information. And sometimes they apply for data to do analyses of the data for policy reasons. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think if I'm not mistaken that this is probably my, my last slide. We have to acknowledge the funding that has been received for this study. It is an ongoing uh, activity to ensure that we have adequate funding to be able to collect these data and to prepare these data for research and also to be able to 
find the time and resources to reach out to participants through development of our newsletters and the dashboards on the CLSA. Uh, and so it's very important to acknowledge the funding. We're largely funded by the Government of Canada through the Can Canadian Institutes of Health Research, through the Canada Foundation for Innovation, and also provincial governments and the universities. The Weston Family Foundation, as I said before, has provided funding, COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, uh, the Jurabinsky Research Institute at McMaster University, and also the Nova Scotia uh, Health Research Coalition and the Public Health Agency of Canada. So I think if I'm not mistaken, Laura, who's leading us, this is my last slide, just saying thank you to all of you for participating. And if there are family members and friends on this call, thank you for supporting uh, the CLSA participants and thank you for, for being here.